Okay. One more second and we should be good to go. Okay, Aditya, put in another link. Aditya, put in another link. Could you just check the Q&A for us? Okay, um, so let's get going. Okay, um, so as a part of this program, we're going to be running four labs. So today is going to be the first lab, tomorrow we're going to run another lab, and the day after tomorrow one more, and finally the application you're building will be on the fourth day. Okay, and all these labs have been built on the cloud, so you don't have to do any installs yourselves. And Amazon and Google have generously donated cloud credits. So the login you got for the QSAT box, so that's going to be allowing you to use 50 hours of cloud time. And everything's going to be done on the cloud, and we'll give you instructions on how to run through these labs in the next few minutes as we continue with the case study. Okay, so what's the plan going to be? Today, for people who have never kind of encountered data science and finance, I want to give you a 60,000 foot view of what does it mean to talk about data science in the financial context. Uh, we will take case study and we will use the case study as a means of getting introduced to the various phases of how you would build a data science application in finance. And for that, what we have done is we have taken a public data set. Uh, the instructions you had to kind of review the Kaggle data sets. It's a publicly available data set using uh, the Lending Club data. And we're going to be using that data set to first understand the data today and kind of explore the data and get a feel for what does it mean to get a really large data set to understand this in the data set today. Tomorrow, um, we'll kind of do a deep dive. And uh, we have chosen a couple of different machine learning models. So I'll give you a very quick introduction to the four machine learning models which we plan to use for this particular data set. And then we'll give you code to implement these four models. And we'll have, by the end of tomorrow when we run the lab, a machine learning model, which will be basically taking this Kaggle data set and implementing an interest rate predictor. Okay? So we'll kind of understand along the way what does it mean to build out an application in Python. For people who have never seen Python before, please don't get really frightened with the language, okay? It's like any other programming language. It has a syntax, it has its rules. The goal for you is to not learn the syntax of the programming language over the next four hours, in the next four days, okay? Uh, we will give you the code just to show you how it's gonna be implemented, and we'll give you resources later on how you can like pick up if you're really keen on building up another programming language as, as a toolkit. Uh, and start working with that. Um, <clears throat> after day two, we'll kind of start talking a little bit about what does it mean to implement and kind of deploy data science solutions. So the first thing you need to understand is because machine learning is data driven, you have a lot of ways in which you can specify your objective. And the way you do it is by specifying, well, this is my criteria. This is how I'm gonna be making decisions. And in order to do that, I need to be able to figure out which models are worthy enough for deployment, right? Because as you know, you can potentially build a really good model 
which all fits for your data, and it may not be generic enough to do any kind of prediction in the future. So you'll have to think about the criteria, the performance metrics you will need in order to be able to uh, do predictions in the future. So we'll talk about primarily how do practitioners use you know, evaluation criteria to choose a particular model before you deploy models into production. And then finally, we'll talk about the, on the fourth day, what does it mean to deploy a model into production? Because you have to learn and build an abstraction for a model and then use this model for prediction. Right? So the fourth day is going to be about once you have built out this entire model, how will you think about moving into deployment? Okay? So hopefully that should give you a clear idea on what does it mean to build out an application, even though you have not built the application yourself from soup to nuts, but we'll give you tools and methodologies so that you can pick it up and then kind of uh, enhance your knowledge from there on. Okay? So let's begin with uh, two things I want to kind of tell you. One is the research hub is going to be your knowledge portal. Over the next four days, we are going to be pushing updates, slides, materials on the research hub. So please bookmark it because any updates will be going into the research hub. By the end of today, afterwards, we're going to be sticking around. We'll make sure that everyone has a login and a password. If you're not able to access, we'll give you access to that so that you can run your labs and you can you know, access the materials. Secondly, the Q Sandbox is the platform through which you're going to be running your labs. Uh, the one thing I've observed is whenever you need to install something which is open source, especially everybody has their own flavor of laptops, everybody has their own operating system, everybody's laptop is in a different state. Trying to get everyone at parity to have a system which can run the code is going to be impossible, especially if you're trying to do a crash course and you're trying to do everything in four days. So we have put everything on the cloud, we have structured everything, so only thing you need to have is a computer with a working browser, a supported working browser. Please make sure that you have either Chrome or Internet Explorer or Mozilla and you have uh, you know, installed all the latest updates and you should be good to go. Okay. So let's kind of uh, start with a quick introduction to data science, you know, especially for people in the financial arena. Uh, data science has been something which uh, has been extremely popular just because of the amazing opportunities it presents and the analysis which can be done, which was never thought possible before. Financial data is very interesting compared to that of image data, right? Because when you talk about a deep learning network or any kind of uh, you know, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering problem wherein there is physics involved or physical processes involved, uh, you have a lot more data. You, know, you can build in sensors and you can collect the data and you can engineer processes. You can engineer algorithms. You have a lot of data, you can do a lot of training, you can understand what's happening. Finance is different because you know, you, people are not rational. The way the markets go up and down, it's not reliant on any physical processes. Even though you think you have the best prediction model, it's not always going to work. Especially if you're trying to use machine learning and data science techniques, in order to build out these kinds of models, you need to have a lot of control. You need to have a lot of say in how you're building these models, how you're gonna be applying these models, what is that extra edge you're getting when you're applying data science and machine learning processes in your investment process. So with all the hype out there, you need to take this technology and science, and you need to be really well-versed in it or have the right people involved so that you can build applications which you know can be applied in a production setting. So when we talk about applications and machine learning, you know everyone wants an answering machine, an oracle which can basically take any question you have and look up information and get you that information. Right? So there is always this blurring of line between what is machine learning and what is artificial intelligence and what is just plain old data processing. Right? So you need to really understand what kind of applications you're building and what is it you're trying to do rather than just saying that, okay, let me have a system which is going to like build out everything and automate everything and you just have like humans just monitoring things which are happening um, in our front end, right? So in order to kind of understand um, how things have progressed, you know, mathematical finance and uh, quantitative finance, if uh, you know, you take a formal course in mathematical finance or quantitative finance or you know, many of our, you know, us professionals as quants, 
we have been using many of these technologies, stochastic models, factor models, uh, many aspects of risk factors, derivative pricing and trading strategies. All these were built primarily by statisticians wherein there was not enough data, there was not enough compute power. So you basically had to take a sample of the data, build out a model, and then figure out, does this model actually work? Do I have the right definition of a model which can be used for any kind of prediction I'm going to be doing in the future, right? So many a times, because of the restrictions you were dealing with, you had to use methodologies and use sampling techniques, and you do not have the opportunity to kind of leverage all the information which was out there, right? And also you had to make modeling assumptions. You know, you had to most likely, if you think about a mathematical model, you would start with a linear model because that's the model you understand, easier assumptions, easier way you can code it up, easier way you can deploy it, right? But nowadays, data science is kind of changing the whole perspective. Now you have abundant amount of data and you have various technologies which were never thought applicable to finance before and now you're leveraging predictive analytic techniques, you're using machine learning techniques, and you're building out algorithms leveraging many other technologies which were never applied in finance before. So if you think about a quant or a data scientist in a financial setting, most likely you're gonna see skills which are on the right side predominantly being used rather than on the left side, right? Doesn't mean that the technologies on the right side are gonna replace the technologies on the left side, it's going to augment many of the things we are doing traditionally, but again, it's a science and transition, so we'll have to basically formulate those processes and build out those processes before you understand whether it's applicable to your business use case or specific use case. Okay, so let's kind of talk a little bit about what does it mean to build out a data science application in today's context, right? So first thing you need to understand is Today, we are dealing with a confluence of uh, many technologies which are coming into play. One is data. We have abundant amount of data. I'll talk a little bit about data. And the second thing is we are having a resurgence of some of the algorithms which were extremely popular in the past and now it's coming back again, and there are these smart algorithms. And hardware is catching up. You know, the power in your cell phone today is much, much more compared to that of a desktop probably in the late 90s or early 2000s, right? So what does it mean? So when you talk about data, uh, you have the four Vs as it's called. You know, if you've taken a class in big data or if you've built any kind of big data application, typically talk about the volume of data, right? So things which uh, are generated nowadays at a very high frequency, you are saving a lot of data. You have granularity of what's actually happening. You're able to capture a lot more details which was not being captured in the past before. And then the velocity of the data, you're getting updates a lot more frequently and the whole alternative data uh, phenomenon which you're observing, or you know, if you're in the trading business, the frequency of the data you are getting, it means that you can't just use traditional technology. If the information is coming to you at a very high base, you can't just snapshot the information just because you're restricted with the hardware or the technology processing capabilities you have on your end. So what that means is you have to be able to build these technologies and mechanisms so that you can leverage these kinds of data sets. But then you also have the variety of data. You know, we just don't have any you know, cleanly arranged rows and columns worth of data anymore. We have a lot of different kinds of data sets, geospatial data sets. You may be getting data from social media, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So you may have to incorporate many of these new data feeds into your investment making, uh, decision making. And then also there's this question of uh, veracity. You know, what data sets do you believe? What data sets are actually usable for your decision making? Along with that, um, we are seeing a lot more frameworks, which uh, has been primarily um, you know, the open source revolution, if you will, has created a whole ecosystem of players and you are a lot more technologies which was never feasible or thinkable in the past before and you have access to those technologies. You know, it's just a question of you being able to download it and install it on your machine and running with it. It would take less than an hour to set up a whole deep learning workstation on your end. 
But what that means is because there's so much available out there, you have to be the decision maker on what should I be using and how should I be using it. So think of it like the internet. You know, if you go to Google, you will be able to search more or less everything. Information is technically free. But if you are trying to use that information for any of your decision making process, you need to be intelligent enough to figure out like what parts of it make sense for me and how do I put those things together so that I can make those intelligent decisions. So even though the cost of most of these platforms are free, you need to be aware of using those strategically and making those decisions. Okay, so those are the algorithms. And the third part is the hardware. Today, hardware is becoming so cheap, the memory, the hard disk, the processing capabilities. So you can pick and choose the technology you want based on the problem you have at hand. Companies like Intel and NVIDIA has made computing so much more accessible. And many times you don't have to think about in the context of algorithms, you can just basically say, I can throw more power, computing power. In the past, when I used to work at MathWorks, you know, when we were working with work, uh, workstations, we would say, well, based on the amount of RAM, based on the amount of processing power we have, we can go up to 10,000 simulations. But today, you could say, well, I can go up to a million simulations or 10 million simulations because all these are parallelly processable, which means that I can either build it locally with my hardware or choose dedicated hardware, or I can throw it onto the cloud. So the, what, what we are doing now for the lab is basically each one of you is instantiating a session on Amazon or Google, and you're gonna be running your own lab. And even though you have your laptops locally in here, it's just basically a facilitator to run your compute load on the cloud. And when we kind of demo some of the labs, you can see that you can just choose the amount of computing power you need, and you can deploy your processing power onto the cloud. And what that means is, most companies do not have to buy any hardware anymore. You can decide what your compute loads are going to be and then decide how you're going to be sourcing those compute loads, right? And which means that you have access to a lot more compute power, but you need to be able to design those mechanisms and machinery so that you are able to build those applications which can leverage all the amazing compute power you have. So the three things, a lot of data, but in order to process a lot of data, you have amazing algorithms which are out there. In order to run these amazing algorithms, you have a lot of compute power which is out there. So it's kind of the virtuous cycle and you are in a great place so that you can leverage all these and build out interesting applications, okay? So that's kind of a big picture of what data science is. So we'll kind of go from 60,000 foot to maybe, you know, I don't know, 10,000 feet. Like, you know, think about like the flight kind of you know, speeding along, you don't see anything, and now we want to get closer to a data science application, so we'll kind of get down to 10,000 feet. Um, so I want to give you a, a very quick introduction to what people talk about when they talk about machine learning. Data science, machine learning, AI, so it depends on who you ask. You know, it's kind of in a spectrum of different possibilities. Uh, the way I kind of define it is, if you're working with a lot of applications, if your goal is to slice and dice the data, understand the data, you may not always be predicting things. You may be summarizing things. You may be trying to understand the description of what you have, descriptive statistics, basically trying to get a feel for what you're working with. And that's basically what data science, right? But when you start saying, well, I have this data, I know the nature of the data, I know what elements of the data I have observed. Can I find relationship between these features or these elements and build a mechanism so that I can predict something more interesting, right? So for example, you know, we all, you know, we'll kind of start gravitating towards the case study we have at hand. We all, you know, transact on a daily basis. And when we, whenever we go and use our credit cards, we are making transactions. We're taking a small loan from the bank, whoever is giving us our credit cards. And every time we go and take a small loan, it kind of adds up to the amount of debt we have. And we are expected at the end of month to repay our loans, right? And we can repay them by in full, or we can take a few months or many years to repay off what we have. And that basically builds our credit profile, our credit worthiness, our ability to repay. So if banks have been observing us on how we have been behaving, either responsibly or irresponsibly in our spending, 
they can start building a model to say, well, if I can find another person similar to this person, and that person with similar uh, demographics, similar uh, you know, salary and work experience and things like that. So what would be the expected credit worthiness of this particular person, right? So they can start building models. So in the past, people were using gut feel, business rules to build these models. Nowadays, people are leveraging just data using machine learning to build these kinds of models. So let's get to the science a little bit. So if you start talking about machine learning, um, there are typically two types of models which people you know, usually talk about. Uh, one is what's called as a supervised learning model. And that basically means I have a bunch of data, but I have a label. The label could be a numerical label or it could be a categorical label. If I'm able to build a model which can take my data, pass it into a model, and can get these labels out, then I could think about it as a supervised learning model. And what I could do is I could leverage historical data, I could leverage, uh, you know, augment it with simulated data, and then build out a model which could be used for building out these predictors. Right? In case I'm predicting a number, so if I'm predicting salary or if I'm predicting, uh, you know, some kind of uh, interest rate, I will call it as a prediction model. If I'm building out a class, a A or an A, you know, should I give a credit card? Yes or no then I'll call it a classifier. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, another class of models, which will not go a lot of depth into in this uh, uh, seminar, is what's called as an unsupervised learning model. And in an unsupervised learning model, what you do is, you basically have data, and you're thinking about, well, it's too much information for me. Can I segment it in ways so that I can individually look at data? And that's basically what's called as a clustering problem. Can I understand the similarities in these observations and build out a model which will help me kind of segment it into different classes? Okay. So, in the context of what we are trying to do, you know, you can think about um, unsupervised learning model as a model which does not have any correct results because you don't know, you don't have any labels to check against. So, you're basically taking your entire data set and saying, well, what can I do with it? Can I segment it into different buckets? Or can I use some way of reducing this amount of data into a smaller data set? So one example of data, data reduction, if you have you know, looked at statistics, is a PCA, or a principal component analysis, where you're reducing the number of features to a smaller set of features, which is still capturing the variability you have in your original data set. Another way to look about it would be like clustering. You know, rather than saying, thinking of the whole thing as one bucket, I'm going to take this entire data set and split it into multiple buckets based on similarity, and then figure out what I can do with individual buckets. Right? But note that you're not specifying the business rules up front. You're leveraging the information which you already have and figuring out, can I build distance metrics? Can I build similarity metrics and come up with means so that I can automatically do these segmentations? So that's why it's going to be a machine learning problem. Okay, so let's kind of look at another problem, and uh, uh, we'll kind of talk about some of these methodologies in the next session. But uh, let me let me kind of move on to the supervised learning problem. So here, um, what you're primarily looking at is I have a bunch of variables, and I've been observing these variables, and I also have labels, which could either be numerical or categorical labels, and based on this information. I want to come up with a mechanism so that I can come up with a model so that if I observe these variables in the future, I can come up with an expected prediction based on the model I'm using. And then there are various types of models. And some of these models you'll typically hear in the machine learning sense. One is classical regression. How many of you have used regression in the past? Okay, so you already know one machine learning model. Just the methodology and how you would actually use it, but you already know uh, some machine learning uh, there are some additional techniques like decision trees or random forests, which are typically used uh, in augmenting some of these traditional techniques. And the most popular one nowadays is neural networks. And it's, uh, you know, if you've never used neural networks before, think of it as, well, I don't want to specify my model, but I'll kind of give it a structure so that the model can learn various weights and biases on its own and build a very complex model. Uh, but for most uh, you know, analysis purposes, it's just going to be a black box. 
Okay. So those are some of the models people typically use. And we'll kind of show you how to build each one of these models and tell you a little more as we go through the, go through the program. Uh, but just to give you like a mental perspective, there is unsupervised learning models and there are supervised learning models. If you do not have labels, you use unsupervised learning models. If you have labels or if you have observed things in the past, then you use supervised learning models. Okay. Okay. So what do people typically do when they typically build out a data science or machine learning application? Let me summarize them into four steps. So that's going to be like the structure of the four days you're going to be working on. So the first thing people typically do is looking at the data pre-processing or the EDA, which is trying to understand what data you're working with. The second thing people typically do is once you understand the nature of the data, can I leverage this data and build out and try out different machine learning models? Okay, so that's uh, uh, what do you call? There is no real science on how do you go from step one to step two. That's where your exploration skills comes in. That's how your uh, experimentation skills comes. So you have to do a design of experiments to figure out. Well, I'm going to run a couple of supervised learning algorithms or a couple of unsupervised learning algorithms and try out various aspects. The third thing people typically do is well. There are multiple models I can choose from. Based on my objective, what model should I use? Right? Sometimes it could be interpretability, and that's priority. Let's say in healthcare, you want to be able to interpret what kind of a model you're building. Sometimes you would say, I am only going to be focused on accuracy. I'm going to be only focused on PNL. So depending on the objective at hand, you'll think about building and selecting models based on performance metrics you're going to be concerned. And then lastly, you need to think about deploying it. Because whatever you do, if you can't deploy it, it's just going to be an experiment sitting on your desktop. Right? So what that means is the journey starts then. It's not when you deploy, you can like, you know, say I'm done with my job and I can go uh, and have a vacation. That's when the monitoring starts. You start figuring out whether this model actually works. How well, it, uh, how well does it work? Is it actually giving me the same accuracy or performance metrics I designed it when I originally started? Or is it kind of degrading? Is it time for me to update the model? What should be the frequency of the update of my model? If my model stops performing, how do I put in the brakes and make sure that the models don't kind of break my other processes, right? So the goal of this whole process is to build out a whole engineered process so that you understand every phase in intimate details, and then you know what is going to be the end result of this whole process, and then also have a qualification criteria to see whether the outcomes are usable or not. Okay. So let's kind of take one step at a time. So um, how many of you had a chance to review some of the materials which was posted? Okay, many of you. Uh, Python tutorials, anyone got a chance to try it out? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so the case study in the lending club, so this is a very popular data set. You know, I've taught this class um, in a, the data analytics class a couple of times, and this is always a very popular data set because um, you have very uh, good information and, um, you know, it's also very personal, right? Like, you know, everybody uses a credit card and you all know what the process is like. So you can relate to what's actually happening when you look at these data sets. Um, so let's kind of get a feel for what does it mean to talk about like credit risk in the consumer context, right? So typically for a large institution, um, when you talk about scoring of um, uh, models, you have to make decisions. Uh, typical decision would be, should I grant credit or not, right? Um, if you're trying to increase or decrease the spending limit, what are the criteria we should be using? Um, if you have to increase or decrease the lending rate, what criteria should we be using? And then, uh, can I give different products because of the way people are spending? Can I give them different products or alternate products which meets their specific need? So there are interesting decisions which banks need to do both in the context of technology and also in the context of business use cases. Historically, I mean, you go 50, 100 years back when you know loans were typically uh, done by you know, uh, rich folks would basically say, okay, here's the loan I could give and I'm the lender. You had the traditional lender and you would go to a traditional lender and say, okay, I can give you X amount of loan. Uh, and based on their social circles, they would know whether this person is credit worthy or not, or if this person is a stranger, I would not give a loan. Right? 
Um, so there were communities of influence which could be used to figure out like, well, should a person be given a loan or not? But then as banks started taking up the whole business of lending, and at that time, you could not rely on just, you know, recommendations and trust. You had to figure out some kind of a scoring mechanism. You had to leverage your past behavior. And then also they had to come up with business rules because they had their lending criteria. They had to figure out like what objective criteria should we be using, what number should we be using, and you had to build out mechanisms. And that's where you start seeing all these rating agencies, the FICO scores, and traditional ways in which you could do lending. Um, now, if you kind of look at the ecosystem in the fintech space, there are a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lending places. Right? How many of you have an account with Lending Club? You know, a couple of you. Uh, but in case you are looking for a loan, traditionally for folks who are credit worthy, it's as simple as just opening up another credit card or going, going to your lender and asking for it, right? Uh, but if you do not have those traditional means, you know, you could go to a platform like Lending Club and say, I need $10,000 of loan because, you know, this payment is coming up or I could even say I want to take a vacation or I want to repay my other loans. Um, and then there are others you could be a lender or you could be a borrower. You know, there are people who will lend to you and it may not be at you know, 10, 15%, it could be 30%, it could be 40%. But if you need that money now, if you're a small business and if you need that money now, or if you really need that money now, and you don't have traditional sources, you can go to a place like Lending Club and get those loans. Now, that's the data set we're gonna be looking at. You know, what kind of criteria do we have and can we even predict the loan based on what past years? What Lending Club has done is, they have looked at their uh, transactions, which has happened over the past five, 10, 15 years, and they've made the data set available. And you can go in and basically get a historical perspective of all the loans which were made, how were those loans funded, what were the reasons given for those loans, who actually took those loans. I mean, the identity is not there, but the demographics and like the criteria of, of the people who are, you know, taken those loans. So all those are available, okay? So the question is, can I use that to build a model which can, you know, given the profile of a person, able to predict like what, you know, interest rate you could potentially get. I mean, this is no way trying to say, well, this is the best model or not. It's just an illustration technique to show that how machine learning could be potentially used. Okay, so that's kind of the setup for the case study. And uh, I've shared some links in the slides you have so you can like, you know, get to know a little more about the alternative uh, credit scoring in the lending space. Uh, now let's kind of uh, do a deep dive for the objective of today's, uh, you know, today's class. Uh, the goal is we want to take this data set and understand the data set a little bit. So we're kind of moving from 60,000 to 10,000 to we are at 1,000. So we are kind of wanting to see the data set close and trying to take a problem, understand the data we have, and build something over it over the next three to four days. So that at the end of the four day, you kind of understand like you know, what does it mean to build out a data science application from top, from top to bottom. Kind of okay, so um, for people who have never uh, kind of worked with the data science application before, a couple of places you can directly go to the data source. Uh, Kaggle is another good place. They host a lot of contests, data science contests. And they also have a bunch of kernels. You can go and look up those kernels and figure out like how other people have approached the problem. If you're just looking for data, there is a lot of you know free data out there in data.gov. Uh, the Federal Reserve has an amazing uh, time series data set, uh, primarily on economics and finance kind of data sets. Or you can use your traditional data sets like Bloomberg or FactSet or any of the financial data you typically be using for any of the investment decision making. Okay, so let's kind of. Uh, uh, so this is just a screenshot to show how does the data look when you try and download the data. Um, so uh, what we have done is we have taken a smaller version. This is like 240 or 250 megabytes worth of data. Uh, we just took a small sample of it so that we can illustrate sort of things over the next four days. Um, so this data set I think has 10,000 records and we'll, we'll kind of explore some of the data set aspects. So when we look at the data, uh, we typically see that there are a bunch of numerical uh, data variable types. 
Uh, for example, you can see the annual income, the delinquency rates, the debt to income ratio, the employment plan, uh, what was the funded amount, uh, what was the grade assigned to that particular loan, does this person own a home or not, what was the installment like, we also have the interest rate for that particular loan, and what was the actual loan, and currently what's the status of the loan, uh, and what was the purpose of the loan. So you have some very rich information about you know, every transaction which could, you could potentially use for you know, building out interesting models. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the data set you're working with. Now, let me kind of switch to the research hub and the lab components so that I can show you things in action. And that way you can like, you know, start building out the lab. Now, um, what we have done is everyone should have gotten an email that the lab is ready to go kind of a thing. So um, you, can, you can do that or we'll keep the lab running for another hour or so after the class ends. But let me give you a demo, and then you can kind of follow along. We'll be hanging around after the session. That way we can like, you know, enable you to do labs, okay? So let's kind of observe like what, what I'm gonna be doing because you've never seen the Q sandbox in action before. Um, so when you log into the research hub, so this is typically what you're gonna see. Um, everyone's gonna get an access to the research hub for one year. Um, so this is basically all some of the workshops and some of the conferences and other things uh, we have done and uh, we have shared all the, videos and the slides out there. If you go into the data science for finance crash course, um, so you're gonna see a video of a past recording of uh, you know, an introduction to data science, some aspects of machine learning and credit risk. So this was a past uh, presentation, uh, but you also have some Python tutorials. So for people who are interested in kind of learning Python, so we have posted some tutorials you can go and learn. So this is the beginning of uh, today's session. So all the slides I just presented is available in here. You can just kind of you know, review those slides in here. And then uh, here, I've kind of you know, shared two things. One is the introduction to the case study. And uh, so I'll kind of walk you through the case study in a little bit. And then the second piece is the summary to the lab. So which is basically what we're gonna be doing and we'll be enhancing this for the next four days. Okay, so the first thing is uh, some of the specifics. As I said before, you know, we are gonna be doing these four parts. We are gonna be getting the data from this uh, Kaggle data set and we're gonna be doing exploration today. Uh, the second thing is uh, what we're gonna be doing is we'll build out primarily using Jupyter. How many of you have ever used or never used uh, the Jupyter notebook, never used Jupyter notebooks? Okay, so we'll kind of give you a quick introduction to what Jupyter Notebooks are and how to access it. And then we'll kind of, you know, uh, in part two and part three, we'll work through a bunch of machine learning models and we'll compute some metrics. And then in part four, we're gonna show you how to deploy a machine learning model, okay? So the case study itself, um, so let me kind of, uh, you know, jump into, um, think, Aditya, can you help me for a second? So uh, let's, uh, uh, did you say I should get an error on the word? Which, what, which one do I use? So which one is on the code? So when you click on the link you got, um, so you'll see something like this. Um, uh, sorry, log in is slow. Yeah, you want to do it in Chrome? So that's what. Okay. So this is what you're going to see. 
and uh, let's click on this view demo. And uh, what that's going to lead to is this is basically an experiment. We have containerized all these experiments and we have made it available on the cloud. Uh, so you, the link you click will take you to a task page, which you'll see a running lab like this. Okay. And when you click on this green button, uh, it will tell you that you have to log in using QSandbox and a password. And when you launch it, so what's happening now is this whole instance is running on Amazon. And we have put the whole lab together, all the required packages, the Python packages and everything. So the whole thing is running on Amazon. Okay. And you can look at the code now. So once I log in, um, so you will see a folder called work. And when you go into this work folder, you'll see the data science crash course. And in this project, you will see something called as a notebook. So basically what uh, has happened in the past five to seven years or so is, you know, when you talk about tooling, people would use tools like Stata or SAS or MATLAB, and you would install all the software and build out the whole environment and then run it locally. Uh, but uh, Python, as it's gotten more and more popular, there have been multiple uh, open source projects which are there to support Python and other programming languages. And one of them is what's called a Jupyter. What Jupyter does for you is, you can run all your code, Python R or whatever it is, on a server somewhere, and you can just use a browser to access all the code. So whenever you use your browser and I'm clicking and I'm showing you the code, the code is actually running on Amazon. But you are actually writing the code and running the code locally on your browser. And whenever you execute things, it goes back to the cloud and gets executed on the cloud. So you don't have to do any installs locally at all. Everything's going to be running in the cloud. OK, so here, um, so I'm clicking on this notebook. And when I do an exploration, um, you're going to see a Jupyter Notebook come out. So we'll share the code if you want to install and try it out locally. But the simplest thing is to you know, just access the running cloud you have it here. OK, so here, let's kind of uh, uh, look at the code. Uh, now, some of this is going to be new to you if you have never coded in Python before. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, the first, the labs which are done in here will be for free. Then you'll have 50 additional hours to try out on your own. Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of give you a couple more things as we. Yeah, um, so for people who are um, on the streaming channel, so apparently the camera isn't positioned properly and you're not able to see what's actually happening. Um, the research hub actually has a link for the streaming thing, but what you'll have to do is um, we will uh, share another email after the class on how to access QSandbox, but in order to follow along, um, so I'm just going to see if I can like switch to um, switch to the screen so that you can uh, you know, see what's happening on the screen. Give me one second. Um, see any way in which I can uh, switch this to um, so we'll probably have to send you an email with some specific instructions on how to follow along um, I don't know if there's a way to like move the camera Anyways, we'll just get with the demo and we'll, we'll kind of share additional details later, just in the interest of time. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's kind of uh, look at what's actually happening in here. Um, Python, the way it works, you have the core programming language, 
And think of this as, well, you need a kernel to execute Python, but then you need additional things to basically do certain specific things. For example, I'll need certain packages for visualization. I'll need certain packages for running machine learning applications. So you can basically download all these packages and build out your programming environment. And here what we have done is we have built that for you, but just because you have built an environment doesn't mean that it's readily available. You'll have to import it so that you can use the functions from those packages. And that's basically the first few lines when we are saying, you know, there are a couple of very popular packages like pandas, numpy, scipy, etc. cetera. Uh, pandas primarily for handling data sets and bringing in into Python. NumPy for probably doing you know, numerical calculations. SciPy and um, uh, scikit-learn is primarily for most of the machine learning stuff they can be doing, okay? And matplotlib is the package which is primarily used for plotting anything in Python. So that's what we're doing in here. And then once we get this data, this data is in the CSV format. So I showed you a screenshot of the kind of elements we're gonna be seeing in here. So that's basically what we have in here. Um, and then the data set, you know, we're just keeping the 9,999 records and there are 17 different features in here. Now, obviously it's very difficult to kind of visualize. I mean, I mean uh, just look at the data and make any sense of it. So the easiest way to kind of understand the data is through visualization, right? So typically in data science, what you do is you start with exploratory data analysis, build out charts and graphs, build out summary measures so that you understand the data. And once you have a clear idea of what data you're working with, then you go about and build out additional models. So let's kind of understand some basics of the kind of data we are looking at. In terms of features, uh, we have some integers, we have some floats, and out of the 17, we have a bunch of other factors. So that's like a, a power graph. And then we can kind of you know, do a, a correlation matrix to understand what's the relationship between the numerical features. So when I look at the heat map or the correlation matrix, so you can see that you have the interest rate in here and interest rate and um, annual income. So you can kind of see that, uh, you know, if you look at like the lower diagonal, so these are like the uh, elements in here. So you can see that there's high correlation between interest rate and annual income. Uh, you can see that there's very decent uh, correlation between interest rate and debt to income ratio. Um, so that's how you can kind of see if there are variables which are potentially correlated. And then you have a bunch of categorical features in here. So we can look at what the features are, whether there's a car payment, whether there's a credit card, what was the reason uh, for you know, taking this loan? It could be either to repay a credit card or debt consolidation or home improvement for buying a house, for major purchases, for medical, moving. These are typically the reasons for people are using Lending Club for, for that analysis. And then you have a bunch of categorical variables in here. So you have like term, the grade of the loan, employment length, uh, home ownership, the verification status. Uh, so you have a bunch of different categorical features. And then you can take the numerical features and then compute some uh, you know, summary measures like mean, standard deviation, uh, the different quartiles, the kind of variability you see in different aspects. So you can see that uh, the average loan amount was around $12,800. Uh, the standard deviation was close to $9,000. So you can say that, you know, most, the majority of the people, more than 60% of the people are borrowing anywhere between 12,000 plus or minus $10,000. Uh, you know, the lower quartile, the first 25% is 6,000, then the maximum is $35,000. So in the dates that we're currently working on. Okay, so then you can start looking at the kind of loan amount distribution. So you can see that, uh, you know, if you look at just basically the, uh, the density of how the people are kind of, you know, taking loans. Um, so you can get a feel for what kind of, you know, most people are taking loans between zero and $10,000, okay? Then if you look at their annual incomes, you can see that you know, it's anywhere between zero and 100,000. So you have a tail, but most people have an income range between, I don't know, between like 25,000 to $75,000 or so. And then you can look at the purpose for various distributions. So here you can see that debt consolidation is like the predominant use case why people are actually going to Lending Club for, for getting a loan. Uh, 
the other one is credit card payments. There's other they didn't want to specify. Some for small businesses, some car payments, uh, some for vacation. Very few people are loaning money at the uh, lending club to take a vacation, I guess. Um, and then you can kind of you know figure out you can represent the same thing in a in a different form using some pie charts. Uh, you can also look at various states. Where are these people from? You know, with the lending club data set, you can see a lot of people from California. We haven't normalized it to population in here, but uh, you can see a lot of people from New York, California, taking loans in here. Um, and then you can kind of you know plot out like the various percentages and do some additional analysis. The point here being. You know, if you just have a tabular data set, and if you're trying to build out a model uh, without really understanding what you're trying to get into and what you're trying to do, it's going to be extremely difficult. So you have a lot of interesting tools, and this probably took a few hours to write the whole thing. For people who are proficient with Python, it's just a few hours to basically bring in the data, put in different kinds of graphs, and then you can focus on your analysis, right? Um, there are a bunch of packages, Matplotlib, Seaborn, Plotly, which you could potentially use to build out these packages. But in the typical data science application, before you start building models, you bring in the data, you try to get a feel for the data, you try to analyze the data, and then get a feel for like what kind of data set you're working with before we move to the next step. Okay? So that's basically a gist of what you're going to be doing in your first lab. Now, once you understand what's happening in here, you can start formulating your own questions. You could potentially say, well, if you are coming from a lender's perspective, let's say you're a hedge fund, and you think, well, you know, rather than me investing in an asset, how about we lend money to all these people who are you know, getting loans, and I'm going to target people who are looking for 30 to 40% interest rate, and I'm going to be lending it to those people. So what kind of credit worthiness do they have? What kind of reasons are they asking for for those loans? So you can start filtering the data set based on interest rates and then figuring out the nature of the population and then assessing your risk, whether you would want to take so much of risk for, and then you can start with the defaults and you can formulate interesting questions and go through that. Okay, but we kind of just sliced and diced the demographics of the people and we really just kind of figured out what kind of data we were working with. Okay, so that's kind of the summary for day one. Okay, so it's a very fast paced introduction. I know we had some technical glitches in the beginning, uh, but next class, what we're going to be doing is hopefully by the end of the day, you will have run through the lab, you would have gotten a feel for the data. From tomorrow, we're going to start building a model. So we'll kind of explore a couple of different models and figure out like how to start building out models. And the day after, we're going to start evaluating the different models, which models are good. And then on the fourth day, we'll try to deploy our own application so that you can pass in some data. And that's going to tell you what interest rate you're going to be getting at. Okay? So uh, it's 4.10, we went a little bit further, but if there are one or two questions we'll take and we'll stop the session for the day, um, and then we'll help you out, we'll be hanging around. I think we have to leave here by 4.30 or so. We'll be hanging around if there are any access issues or any lab issues, but um, uh, we'll meet here again sharp at 3 o'clock tomorrow, okay? Any questions? No. Okay, so we'll pause the recording. Yes, please. I'm sorry? Oh, did I say two? I'm so sorry. Three o'clock. Sure. So I would recommend get through the slab. Get through the slab, review the slides again, get through the slab. You'll be prepared, so you'll have a clear understanding of what data you're working with. So you can, you know, we'll be using the same data to build the next models. So you know, you'll be kind of, you know, clear with what data you're working with, so that you can start getting into the modeling part easily. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so for people on the streaming channel, so we, what we're going to do is. Uh, apologies for the for the technical difficulties. We we're just trying to figure out like how to how to kind of you know get the screen on to you guys. Um, so one thing we will do is we will post another document so that uh, the CLAD document, the lab document on how to go through and run through the entire lab. Uh, so if you go to researchhub.qsandbox.com, give us like two more hours 
by six o'clock, you'll find a lab document, which will give you like step-by-step -step instructions to go through the QSAN box, click on the respective link, and then access the entire lab. Um, we went through a very fast introduction to the lab, so but we will be posting specific instructions on how to run through the lab in the next hour to two hours or so. So please, uh, if you could follow along, you can try the lab now, else we're going to send out instructions on how to try out the lab on your own once you uh, once you have the document. But please look at researchhub.com, so researchhub.qsandbox.com, that's where we're going to be posting those instructions. Um, I see if there are any questions we can answer.